This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. This episode is about two things. Number one, Google, one of the most recognizable brands today. We know them from the operating system on our phones, to their smart home devices, to Google Search, Google Maps and Gmail, and even YouTube itself. They're an organization that's so prevalent that they're almost invisible. And the other thing that this episode is about is the CIA, the same organization that overthrows foreign governments and spies on leaders and citizens. From human rights violations to drug trafficking, the CIA has always been shrouded in mystery and controversy. So what does Google have to do with the CIA? Well, many people may not realize this, but the CIA was directly involved in the foundation of Google. Google co-founder Sergey Brin even reported to representatives of the US intelligence community on his progress. Not only this, but the application that became Google Earth originally had CIA investment. Generally, this is a concerning relationship, but in this episode, we're going to take a deeper look. First of all, let's take a brief look at the CIA. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. After World War II, the United States would face the Soviets in a battle for world supremacy. The invention of the atomic bomb meant that no weapons could be fired in this war, so other methods had to be used. Over the next 40 years, a period known as the Cold War would begin. No shooting, just subversive tactics. In the mid-1940s, the President of the United States, inspired by the efforts of the UK's MI6 during World War II, would sign the National Security Act, which formed the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. And right away, the CIA would get to work interfering in international politics. In an effort to stave off communist influence on the global stage, the CIA would interfere with the 1948 Italian elections. They would overthrow the governments of Iran and Guatemala in 1954, Indonesia in 1957, and Brazil in 1964. The CIA also conducted some rather questionable projects on their own people. Project MKUltra, for example, was the CIA's mind control program using, quote, chemical, biological, and radiological methods. Many of the studies within MKUltra focused on the administration of LSD to prisoners, drug addicts, mental patients, along with government agents and the general public, all without their consent. Documents pried loose in 1979 showed that through a front organization, the Central Intelligence Agency funded what was called the MK Ultra Project. The CIA wanted to understand more about brainwashing. It had money and it was ready to fund experiments, breaking down the mind with repeated electric shocks and drugs, including massive doses of LSD. These experiments were done without the informed consent of the patients. Lawyer Alan Stein took up some of the rejected cases. The government's paid a number of settlements since. Many of the payments come with non-disclosure agreements. They're trying to do it quietly. It's not fair. I mean, I feel, I feel blessed that I was able to get this far for my parents. I, I really do. That's what gives me justice. I'm just grateful to be able to do it, and I hope you, I, I just hope that uh, you can hear me up there because it might bring you peace. It might bring you both peace. Ultimately, the CIA's goal of using LSD as a mind-altering weapon against the Soviet Union and other enemies never reached fruition. But by the time the project was disabandoned in the mid-1960s, hundreds of people were unknowingly drugged and observed. I found this last one pretty entertaining. One of the most embarrassing failures of the CIA was the attempted assassination of Cuba's Fidel Castro. So, you know, in interviews, Fidel Castro used to say, if surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic sport, I would win the gold medal. Reportedly, more than 600 attempts over his 50 years in power. Now, many of the failed plots were concocted by the CIA. The CIA tried infecting Castro's scuba gear with tuberculosis, planting exploding seashells at his favorite diving site, slipping him a poisoned fountain pen. They even tried poisoning and slipping a bomb into one of his cigars. All of these attempts were a failure, 
It was a gigantic waste of time and money, and Fidel Castro was Cuba's dictator for another 49 years, stepping down in 2008 only due to failing health. This is all to say, the CIA may seem formidable, but when it comes down to it, they're not always perfect. With the Soviet Union gone, the CIA's actions today may be less well known, but their influence on the world certainly hasn't gone away. And that brings us to their relationship with Google. In 1994, two PhD students, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, began working on their automated web crawling and page ranking application as part of their research project. They had bet on making the exploding internet easy to access, and it paid off enormously. Sergey Brin's part of the Stanford research was funded by the NSA and CIA. Brin would often report progress to non-Stanford individuals, one of whom was Dr. Rick Steinheiser. Steinheiser represented the CIA's Office for Research and Development to oversee their research funding in a joint CIA-NSA program. It wasn't uncommon at the time for research projects to be funded by the intelligence community. Government intelligence agencies had set up programs and often seed-funded projects. Roughly three to four million dollars of funding flowed through the intelligence community programs into universities. And while both Google and the intelligence community deny that the CIA directly funded the start of Google, it's evident that the intelligence community's research funding helped not only Google, but Silicon Valley as a whole. There are many ways this relationship is built and preserved. One of the biggest is perhaps the Highlands Forum. There's a good chance that you've never heard of this forum, but it connects the wider Department of Defense and the intelligence community to the tech startups. This keeps the military and the intelligence community at the cutting edge of tech. Many executives on the Highland Forum hold positions in the CIA, NSA, and many other agencies. Movements from these agencies into Silicon Valley is common. For example, in 2012, the Highland co-chair, who also worked at DARPA, left the agency to accept a senior executive position at Google. In an email thread made public, Sergey Brin discussed information sharing for the purposes of national security with the head of the NSA. In 1999, at the peak of the dot-com boom, the CIA launched InQtel, a Silicon Valley venture capital fund. Its mission was to invest in startups that aligned with intelligence agencies' needs. In 2003, the CIA, through InQtel, would invest in Keyhole, Keyhole was a startup that built 3D global mapping software. One of its first uses was to support US troops during Operation Iraqi Freedom, the campaign to overthrow Saddam Hussein. The next year, Google bought Keyhole, whose team now included CIA personnel. Google would soon turn Keyhole into the basis for Google Earth. Only a year after the purchase, the director responsible for initially investing in Keyhole at the CIA investing firm, InQtel, moved to take a position at Google. During this period, Google would win contracts for different search applications for the NSA and CIA. It's understandable that Google has a relationship with the CIA and many other government agencies. In fact, most tech giants do. At the start of this year, with a looming US election, some of the biggest names such as Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, and Google have had meetings with the FBI, Homeland Security, and the Office of the Director of National Security. Little is known about these meetings, apart from the theme of how tech giants can ensure security for the 2020 elections. Google, for example, has implemented an advanced protection program. This program offers Google's highest protection level to high-risk targets such as journalists, activists, politicians, and business leaders. It effectively makes these accounts less susceptible to hacking risks, such as phishing and malware attacks. But perhaps the greatest demonstration of the company's integration into the intelligence community is Google Federal. Google Federal was launched in 2006, and its purpose is to serve federal contracts. At a certain point, this branch of Google had so many former NSA staff that they became known as the NSA West. At its very launch, Google Federal went on a hiring spree, hiring managers and salespeople from the Army, Air Force, CIA, Raytheon, and Lockheed Martin. It added to its lobbying prowess by assembling a team of Democratic and Republican operatives. 
The strength of the relationship between Google and the intelligence community was graphically highlighted in 2010. At this time, Google came under attack from what was believed to be Chinese government hackers. The NSA came to Google's aid. The two organizations struck up a deal, an exchange of information. According to journalists, quote, Google agreed to provide information about traffic on its networks in exchange for the intelligence from the NSA about what it knew of foreign hackers. Google Jigsaw is a division dedicated to combating global threats such as extremism, censorship, and disinformation. But this division has had its missteps. In 2012, as the Syrian civil war was escalating, the intelligence community was pushing for a change of government. In 2016, leaked emails revealed that Google's Jigsaw department brainstormed ways that it could push Bashir al-Assad from power. Among these ideas was a tool that visually mapped and tracked officials who broke allegiance to Assad's government. Jared Coheen, head of Google Jigsaw, planned to show this data on TV networks such as Al Jazeera within Syria. The purpose of this was to serve as propaganda to give confidence to the opposition of Assad. This opposition was, of course, the side that the intelligence community wanted to win. According to Fred Burton, a former intelligence agent at the security branch of the State Department, quote, Google is getting White House and State Department support and air cover. In reality, they are doing things the CIA cannot do. More recently, Google created a tool to track if users are at high risk of radicalization based upon their internet usage. The tool redirects them to government websites focused on persuading them of their ideas. It seems now, more than ever, Google and other tech giants are blurring the line between corporate and government intelligence. Google's entry into the market makes financial sense. By 2019, the federal government was spending $90 billion a year on information technology. It's a huge market and Google seems to want to maintain a strong presence. The world in which the CIA and the intelligence community operates is a distant cry from reality and what most people are aware of. Likely, we will never know the full extent of their operations or the events that the CIA had an impact on. From helping overthrow governments to spying on the public, many controversies follow this organization. We didn't even touch on drug trafficking operations during wartime in Asia, Watergate, or the recruitment of former Nazis. That being said, it could be argued that there are just as many less sensationalized activities that have kept peace in the world that the public would never be aware of. Such is the nature of this organization's work. Secretive. Egmatic. As technology and the freedom of information give power to the masses, there is now a rising risk of an adverse technocracy. What hand will tech giants play in this future? And what does this mean for the world and society if private companies begin running intelligence and intervention programs on the public? Many years ago, when I was younger, I used to be fond of Google, but now I look at them differently. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. I've become more aware of protecting my online privacy as time has gone on. Lately, I've been using ExpressVPN as it's one of the best ways to do that. You can choose between one of 3,000 servers around the world to have your data routed through. This hides your IP, allowing you to browse the web anonymously. Another benefit is that you can watch content that may be blocked in your country. For example, if I wanted to watch the movie Ex Machina on Netflix, it's blocked in Australia where I live. I can just turn on ExpressVPN, set it to the United States, and I'm good to go. You can get three months of ExpressVPN by clicking the link in the description below. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you did get something out of it. It's a bit disconcerting, but I think it's better that people are aware of this kind of thing. So for those who are interested in videos kind of like this, I've done an episode on how governments hack each other, another episode on the dark web, and one more on WikiLeaks. So thanks for watching. My name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll catch you again soon for the next video. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's new thinking.